Rona, thanks so much for joining me on the Love and Courage podcast. I first met you uh, several years ago. You were playing, I think you did a performance, but you also made a very impassioned speech in Christchurch Cathedral. And I remember thinking, if we were ever going to go to church again, like Hosea says, take me to church, I want Rona Gallagher on the altar. <laughs> like the Reverend Al Green. Oh. Yes. Well, I mean, I Thank suppose you. a lot of your music is, you're, you're kind of, it's coming, it's soul music, you know? Yes, it's, it's so, certainly is soul music, yeah, Northern Soul. Um, yeah. yeah, I mean, I think, you know, I was looking at amazing footage the other night of gospel, you know, performances, great gospel performances in a brilliant documentary called American Soul and about um, certain artists becoming politicized and speaking out about the social issues at the time when even the Supreme started to speak out. Yeah. Uh, we love child and they lost the glamour of the Supremes and they were wearing their sort of, you know, their tenement clothing and, you know, sort of cut off denim shorts with like tassels at the end. Diana Ross chose it, you know, performing this way. And I thought, you know, well, that's where all soul comes from is from the working class, from the poverty parts, which is where I'm from. Um, so it is so it's you know obviously I'm white and I'm from Derry but uh, I mean that's the music we grew up to you know and the music that um, is the voice of uh, you know people that grew up under um, a very oppressive uh, dominant colonizer yeah so um, yeah I mean it is it's gospel it's soul and it's also it's the music I just the rhythmic and the, the sound of the music that I love so yeah I mean that's the music I relate to Am I right in thinking that it, it might have been American soldiers that brought soul to Derry? In, yeah, in, it was. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. In, uh, in the early 60s. I mean, my mum and dad would have been huge collectors of it, mum especially. And um, they would have the most incredible show bands, obviously, you know, the legacy of the show bands mm. in Ireland. So they would all pass through Muff and all around Donegal and Derry and the embassy and the Stardust and um, the record stores would always, you know, order in the vinyl. I mean, I still have... 1964, uh, uh, 45s of my mum's, and 1967, Never Loved a Man originals of uh, Atlantic Soul, 45s of Aretha that my mum gave me, and then I had to give them back to her. But, uh, oh, wow. Yeah. It must have been amazing those, those times at the dance halls, and, and like, I don't know, like, I mean, we've probably a lot of us grew up with electronic music or indie music, but yeah. like, those yeah. nights of just dance, I mean, I probably. Yeah, yeah. Very much so. I mean, you hear so many wonderful stories. My parents talk about Derry before the troubles, obviously, you know, got very heavy. But in the uh, early 60s, you had a city of Derry, which was obviously a port town. But my daddy said there was neon everywhere, you know, which is such an incredible beauty to have in your town when a town is lit up at night by neon. And you had the Italian community. So you had your late night coffee shops, Yanarelli's. Fiorentini's. Oh, wow. I did not know that. I didn't know yeah, that. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And I mean, alcohol, you know, and, and the um, people, you know, socializing around that wasn't uh, the focus point um, of, of, of socializing in those days. It was how you looked. And Derry was full of mods at the time. And, you know, looking the part, going and getting the cup of tea. I mean, neither of my parents drank. So they were all about the clothes, getting the hair. My mom was a hairdresser. And she used to have the short jean trimmed in hair. She was an absolute beaut. The eyelashes out to here. And my dad would always have his suit on. And they would go for the tea to the embassy. We photographed them drinking their tea. And you would have God of Mercy, the Miami show band on. You would have had um, the platter men. And I mean, the list is endless of this talent of, 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 uh, of the show bands yeah. and they would emulate all the soul and they you know that the american soldiers that some of my mum's girlfriends friends did end up marrying and moving away away in the naval um sailor guys they couldn't believe the standard of music from the show bands in ireland because mm. it sounded just like the record you know they were like mm. doing the booker t they were doing all the great soul stuff and my mum said that the soldiers used to be there in awe of how brilliant the sailors that we'd be made in awe of how brilliant the bands were yeah and obviously that permeated through into other musical genres because Derry's always had a very high concentration, like musically, or maybe that's just a working class struggle. I don't know. What, what, uh, what could you attribute that to? Well, the music that they had access to very much. So I mean, all the great bands that we, you know, would have grown up with, obviously, um, the soul bands, but then you would have had, the, obviously, the British rock. 
you know, they are port towns, you know, the Liverpool, yeah. and, you know, the Mancunians and the Londoners, you know, and they would have had access to records and great radio stations, obviously, and the great music was being made. So um, I do think that is, um, you know, it's definitely to do with, uh, you know, working class communities, you know, the focal point would have been socializing, you know, the dances, the music, the going together, um, crossing all communities, all divides, you know, music would have mm. been, you know, the unification. So, um, yeah, you know, and it's turning out your best side as well, you know, because, I mean, I often have wondered on the soul boys that I would have known later in years, um, you know, that were would have been from, you know, like, the south east end of, of London, you know, you, you wouldn't have let on you were a docker if you had been a docker. If you ever worked in class or you were a minor, northern guys you would have met and you know over the years of filming that their parents might have been minors, you would always have tried to hide the fact that you were a working class man or a working class woman. And then at night you would turn out in your 100% best luck to hide the fact that you might have been yeah. down a mine or down the docks all day. And that's kind of where the whole you know, looking, looking the best when it came, you know, just class systems. I mean, you know, we're seeing so much still of the class system now during what's happening as regards who gets priority for hospitalization or, or testing. We're still very much, I think, still living in, in yeah. class structure, but that's, that's a bigger argument. That, you know, that, bigger. It, it struck me what you said there about, you know, I mean, it's really that music brings people together, but you know, the fact that, uh, a city like Derry or, or the north of Ireland or even the north and south of England there's divisions all over the world but like music and art and culture the, the ability to let people forget about their, their troubles and their struggles and come together and, and just dance and be free and I suppose that's particularly poignant at the moment where we think about that yeah. need and I, God knows we're probably all doing up bucket lists of music and festivals and yeah but you certainly give you a new appreciation for me anyway very much so Rory. i mean i often look out in audiences you know and i've been very blessed to work in in very beautiful productions of theater where you might have 1200 people there a night you know and there's moments as you get more confident in your performance or the run of the show and you're not thinking about everything that's going on the stage and you can sort of breathe. And then, you know, as you're, if you're doing a long run, say if, you know, three or four months or whatever, and you know, you, it's like second nature to you by the time you get on it, sort of halfway through. And, you know, if you're bold enough to sort of break the fourth wall, as they call it, and you look out at the audience, you know, um, and you sort of study human beings as they're watching theater and music, you know, um, when you look at people in an audience, there's such innocence and vulnerability and such beauty in people's faces because we're all a child again. Mm. You can see people looking, you know, and you'll often get the, you know, the open mouth kind of stare. And it's like when kids, we did War Horse in the National Theatre for 18 months, you know, on and off between the National and then the West End transfer like 10 years ago. And sometimes you would have kids run to the front of the stage, you know, because it was on the school book curriculum, Michael Moore Pugo's work. So you'd have children would run to the front of the stage sometimes to see what was in the book, you know, and they've no concept that this can't be done. And it was mind blowing to see the wee hands just go up on the stage and then they these wee they just they had no concept that you couldn't do that. And it was mind blowing. And then you'd see men that were British soldiers in the Second World War that were sitting in the front row, that were traumatized by what they were seeing because they had been there and they'd watched the futile, you know, what is the point of this? And their friends obviously blew to smithereens and that tra trauma that they were kind of reliving. And when you see that power of theater and the power of music, you know, it's, it is unity. And for that one and a half hours or two hours, whatever length of time the performance is, people, I hope, although it's traumatic to watch war being reenacted, you know, you, you, you do hope people are at a sense of uh, peace and they're at a strength, they're at a, they're at a, they're at a place of uh, support, you know, and they're, they're going through something that I hope is cathartic or I hope is supportive. 
and in some way strengthening. And I think we've all taken it for granted. We've taken it for granted as performers and audience maybe took it for granted and we hopefully but never will again. But it's when you look out and you see how important art is mm. and that the artists at the moment are getting such, you know, a tough deal with this whole thing. And some cities are supporting their artists. Some countries are supporting their artists. Some are just getting it tough full stop. But, you know, we really are, uh, you know, we can't live without art. Yeah. We can't live without that because it is... When you look at festivals and you look at what they are, you know, they are in a sense, they're tribal gatherings and they're a place of peace, you know, and in all of us, the ancient primal part of us, we have a tribal draw to be connected to people and you meet certain people in different tribes and you know from the work you do, you'll seek somebody out if you think they have a story or they have something that you know that you'll benefit from to teach somebody else. You know, that's what the great poets have done. That's what the great musicians have done. They travel the country to hear the tune. They travel the country to hear the story before phone, before technology mm. has access to give us that. You know, you go and, you know, you cycle on the bike to get the tune. And we need that. You know, theatre came from tribal performances. You know, when somebody was sent out to tell the tribe there was water over here 10 miles away or there was cattle or buffalo or whatever somebody was sent out to see that the hunter and they'd come back and the tribe would gather around and they would tell the information mm. and that's where theater came from oh here's so and so they're going to do it you know and it might have turned into a performance you know we need it we're only you know we don't really know anything <laughs> you know <laughs> as a human being because we get it so wrong you know as humanity gets it so wrong we can also get it so right but the one thing we do know is we need theater and we need music we need rock and roll and we need art amen amen <laughs> hallelujah thank you very much <laughs> <laughs> mic drop I there i uh, there i'm kind of excited and Brona, do you remember the first time that like music and art and drama and everything entered your life as a child in the first oh, uh, like yeah I mean, art was never, ever, oh, there's art. My yeah. parents, you know, both obviously from, from Derry and regardless of what was going on, we were took, we were, we were, we were taken down to um, the Orchard Gallery, which was based in the beautiful um, Orchard Gallery in the Orchard Cinema in the uh, St. Columns Hall in Derry most beautiful hall. It was built by the people for the people. So, you know, it was there and then it was somewhere else. I think it was in the Foil Art Centre as well. But I remember as a kid, that was the place I remember going to. So Declan McGonagall, who went on to run Emma in Dublin, was the curator and he was married to um, a good friend of ours. And, and we used to go there every time there was an exhibition. On a Saturday, you go down the town and then you go to the Orchard Gallery. So they would have been the contemporary art gallery in Derry. So that's where we used to go. So, you know, that was a norm. Then we would have obviously great music in the house. And my mum was indie David Hockney. You know, they were indie, you know, like a lot of parents at the time, whatever the sort of art going on around. But, you know, like Van Gogh. I remember having Van Goghs in the house, hanging up, um, you know, and just my mother's love of Vogue magazine was always massive in the house. And so she always knew so the, who the artists were at the time. And, you know, Seamus Heaney was obviously God. Mm. And, you know, we were never ever uh, not told about what was going on. So, you know, they, they had obviously the limited access that they had to it. We were showing it. And I don't even think they were sort of doing it consciously kind of go we must teach our children about art you know but that's who they were and I mean I think if my mum you know was uh born in Derry now and growing up in Derry now my mum would be at St Martin's Lane doing or, or the NCAD doing fabric design yeah, she's yeah, a quilter yeah. she's the most extraordinary quilter and she makes the most beautiful work and she does the most stunning little you know 
appliques and all these little, I mean, she's just amazing, you know, her work she does. And, um, and my dad is an amazing, you know, drawer. Um, but he went on to engineering, you know, so given the times that we grew up on, anything that was coming into the town, we were, uh, we were ex exposed to it, you know, which is extraordinary because considering that it was the 70s in Derry, which was horrendous. Yeah, I mean, well, what, well, what, what can you say about the seventies, Brona? Like, what, what is real for you about that as you reflect back now? And I mean, have you, have you processed all of that, or is it still alive? Is it still unfolding as it is for many people? Like, history is a living, breathing experience. I don't know. It is because people can still live in history depending on your personal trauma with history, your life can be changed in one political act. You can be non-political and then something horrific might happen and then you're completely politicized. Mm -hmm. Your life changes, paradigm shift, and you can become an active member of a illegal army overnight. Absolutely. If you are sub subject to what my community was, which was horrific British military injustices, you can become part of a party that will never be respected uh, in our current political situation in the North and in the Dáil, where you will be constantly reminded of your terrorist activity, even though to me there is no more terror than what the British have done throughout the world or in our recent history in Northern Ireland. And... People are very quick to remind the parties that want to represent the native Irish people of what they've done. And they'll very clearly stand in a political uh, meeting with members of the British uh, Conservative parties and the Tories that, that are still causing these problems throughout the world in now of a more economic war that's going on and injustices. So when you come from a place like I come from in Derry, what matters to me now is neutrality and what I can do as an artist to bring people together because my heart is broken about what's happened in the North. And I look at my neighbours and friends that did sacrifice their life in the IRA and in, in, in political parties. And you look back and you think, for what? For what? When you have people that were overnight subject to members of their family being murdered, blatantly murdered, and they'll never get justice for what had happened. And then I look back, you know, a year and a half ago and see Lyra McKee being murdered by children of people that have been traumatized or politicized or jailed for years by the British because of their involvement. There aren't any words except we can't repeat what happened because it doesn't work because colonization is colonization and the native people, like all native people, will then struggle and struggle and struggle and they have to find new identities consistently to be something that is accepted in what modern politics is known as now. So it's very, very difficult because you see the dislike and disdain towards people that really do have an interest in social injustices now, like the housing prices in Dublin, like the standard of living that to me still is geared towards wealthy middle class and towards people that are paying the big brackets of tax, you know, it's not easy for the working class to live a life now that is not without struggle, struggle, struggle. You know, there's a choice to either be on the benefits side of things, but if you're a young couple trying to find a living in Dublin at the moment or trying to find housing that's affordable, it's just near impossible. And there's great people in the parties in Dublin that are trying to change that and they're just not welcome because of their of political parties mm -hmm. who, they're, who they're aligned to. Yeah, it's very real. I mean, for me, uh, some fundamental tenets of a, of a D 
decent society are things like health, education and housing. Yeah. I mean, they're yeah. primary human needs. Yeah. Yeah. Um, like I'm by no means uh, at the, the bottom of any ladder. And I'm very conscious of, of people in much more vulnerable positions. But it, it, the fact that I'm speaking to you from the West of Ireland now uh, is by virtue that, that we, Susan and I couldn't afford to stay in Dublin, yeah. you know. Yeah. Yeah. And, and that's not unusual. And people will then spin that and celebrate it. Well, isn't it great that we'll all move back to rural Ireland and, and it's wonderful. And there are huge benefits yeah. to that. And I would we encourage have an incredible everybody. country. We have an incredible country. Yeah. But the, the bottom line is, like, I was reading a report on uh, Denmark the other day. And you can get the same house in Copenhagen for, like, half the price as Dublin, yeah. you know? Yeah. and. Yeah. Like the money is going somewhere. The rents aren't going up themselves. And we're at the lowest point of house building in something like two decades mm. in this state. So we're being squeezed and squeezed and squeezed. And that has to go somewhere. And my yeah. big concern is that a lot of us are internalizing that angst and rage and, and depression even, you know. So Brona, like my, my big thing is like fundamental tenets of a healthy, decent society are things like health, education, mm -hmm. housing. And if a state can't provide those for people yeah. and yeah. give people a fair crack at a whip, then what kind of state is it and who is it serving? And as we know that there are different masters often being served. And I think that has to come into the, the troubles, if you like, where off time it's pitted against you know one religion over the other one tribe over the other but underpinning it is such a huge economic war being waged on people isn't it yeah you know you've got good people in all you know I th I, you know i think when people start out in politics some people they're, they're fresh and they've got really great humanitarian you know issues at heart and they really want to help people and I just think the manipulation that happens within political parties the pressure all an ego is um flattered by becoming more successful you know and we're seeing the most horrific human egos in the world in our lifetime anyway as men and women in their 40s in America now and in, in you know America especially um and you know the danger of that and how destructive and how how much horror it can cause and i just think you know it's very very easy for parties in ireland to remind the people where i'm from where i'm from you know their history their background and stuff like that but you know everybody kind of forgets how it all started do you know what i mean everybody sort of chooses to forget you know well why did that happen why did these troubles happen you know yeah. and and you just got to keep remembering that you know Armies don't step out of the wall. Armies are created as a reaction, you know, so-called terrorist armies, you know, and they are, and it's horrific and what's happening. I mean, I'm sitting here in Manchester and I have friends here who's lost families in the bombs here in the seventies and eighties, you know, and everything you've got to really, really think about the whole tunnel of, of, of where people come from and, and cause and effect and cause and effect. But Ireland has such potential as a country and if we can just, you know, bring in the great people that we know that are really, really trying to help with the housing, like Owen O'Brien and the brilliant work that Owen's doing, you know, and specifying and, you know, breaking it down to what is actually needed. You know, Dublin is, is, is out of control expensive. I have friends that are trying to afford to live in one bedroom flats for 800, 900 quid a month studio flats. And it's disgusting, but they're being served up to, to pay. Mm -hmm. So, you know, at the same time, we are a democracy, so to speak. You know, when you look around the rest of the world and we can march and we can change things. Mm -hmm. And we do have a voice that, you know, can change legislation. And we have done that in the last three or four years. We've seen, you know, incredible monumental shifts in what we can do as people. So I think Ireland is a great place to be, but I just think we have to really try and sort out the, uh, the capitalist line in, 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 in Ireland and the, yeah. the expense is costing the love there. It's just, it is criminal. I'm struck by the parallels that you you or that that might exist between uh, you know the soul music that you started off talking about and, and you mentioned doc, a documentary that you had watched around uh, struggle and the politics surrounding soul music, but the the parallels with 
Irish music or folk music, like essentially it's, it's a, a sort of folk music, like we're speaking of, like it's no accident for me that soul music landed in Derry, you know what I mean? It's, yeah. it's like, it's, and, and then the parallels are like the, the civil rights movement in the North and the civil rights movement in Alabama and everywhere else. I mean, that's where the flame was, was traveled from in many ways, the inspiration. hundred percent. I mean, I've said it many times, you know, you know, when you have extraordinary articulate, very, very special people like Bernadette Devlin, you know, Bernadette Michalski, when you have somebody like Bernadette coming on this in the late sixties, who has such a gift for articulation, and is able to so finely articulate the situation that's going on, which is what she did. People like Bernadette Devlin have an extraordinary gift to very finely chin and articulate exactly what was going on in Derry at the time. Now, we were British subjects. So essentially, you know, not to keep, you know, repeating myself, but... What happened in Derry happened by the British Army to essentially their own people, the British subjects. And that obviously changed the entire shift, you know, the paradigm shift in the North. Then obviously from 72 onwards, you had the major, major campaign of retaliation, right? So Bernadette Devlin and, and God of mercy on John Hume and, you know, Michael Farrell and people like that, the People's Democracy, obviously John wasn't People's Democracy, but the people from the people from the People's Democracy, uh, the Queen's student movement at the time, were able to articulate the parallel with Black America at the time. Now, I've said this to my African-American friends and they kind of look at you as if to say, you could never understand what it's like to be Black and be from the South. And I can't, because I'm not. But I know what it's like to be from where I'm from. So, you know, when you look at the, sim the symbolism of the free dairy corner, right, which, you know, stood at the end of William Street and Derry, and the, the, the altar, in a sense, that that became the free dairy corner, right, that was taken from, you're now entering Free Berkeley, and the students in Berkeley College that wrote that on the wall, so we were completely paralleled, we, we free Berkeley. Mm. And the young people at the time in Derry and Eamon McCann, who's a close friend, Eamon told me it was the black civil rights movement that paralleled the Derry struggle and actually made people stand up and go, that's us. Even though I would say that with the utmost respect for what was happening. And I can still walk around the world and people don't know where I'm from or my history, but because, if you're black, it's different. And I mean, we're all heartbroken that in this day and age that our black friends still have to stand up and say black lives matter, that we're there still, that we're still there. What? But we so are. And when you see how the right have risen and the amount of racism and the horrific American police force and what they've done in the last, not just three months, but you know, since the emancipation so-called of of uh, the African-American people. So, you know, we did have a parallel to that 100%. And you say that with great discretion and great respect, but that's what it was. Mm. So, you know, you have at the certain time in your life and in human beings' life, you're going to have people that are going to open the doors to humanity and say, this is what's going on. And Martin Luther King did it and he was assassinated. Bernadette Devlin did it in Derry and there was a major attempted assassination on her life and her husband and her children and Bernadette has said it herself it is a miracle that they were not murdered. Now certain people at that time will articulate a injustice and exactly what is going on and you know, AOC right now in America, she's doing it. You know, she is an extraordinary hope for American politics. So, you know, at certain times in any society, these voices will rise up 
and they will articulate and they'll speak the language of the people and they'll speak the language of politics as well and they will go and get what is called you know, the college education and they'll come back and you just pray and hope that they don't run out of steam or that their spirit isn't broken yeah. because politics is one thing you know and politics works you know in tiny ways you know but human beings are you know good i believe essentially human beings all we want to do is be happy be healthy have food on the table have a warm bed not be in an abusive relationship not be an abusive family dynamic look after young people teach them well teach them how to be strong teach them how to look after themselves you know people are good you know but then at the other side of it people are greedy and they're selfish and they'll run you down to get to the top you know so it's finding the fine line you know the fine balance mm. and that uh you know that we try to move through the places where there isn't segregation and there isn't the focus on power, money, arms, oil, all the stuff that, you know, trade, trade, trade. And we all know how, you know, government's only real care is economics and trade and people will die because of it, you know. And I, you know, sometimes my dad said to me, you know, but that's utopia you're looking for. You know, and sometimes I think I'm extremely naive and far too sensitive to actually what's required for life, you know, but we got to keep believing the human beings will will redeem themselves and and look after the trade that we are in and try and do good because you know it's a jungle out there isn't it yeah yeah absolutely i that that phrase they use we got to keep believing like if if you don't believe in the dream of a better life then then you give up you know and where does that leave us um so it's about keeping that torch, that flame alive. Um, the Martin Luther King, I had a dream, but it's, mm. it's, it applies to every country and every community. And I think what we find in dark times, either individually or collectively, that you, and sometimes it does take a messenger, but it, it's to visualize and imagine and see yeah. that we can march our way through whatever marching might look like. You know, it's belief is a big thing. I'm, I'm a big believer in belief. I'm a big believer in belief massively, but sometimes it's like it all falls on top of you and you're just of overwhelmed. Course it does. Of course you know, it does. And that's where the courage kicks in then. Uh, uh, and, and, you know, you know, I'm a huge believer in spirituality and I'm a huge believer in where strength needs spirituality and spirituality needs strength not to encourage violence not to encourage yeah. reaction and you know when you have a leader that encourages peaceful demonstrations but you know is then crushed by military or militia coming in you know how does one not react then and how do you tell the african communities african-american communities now not to react to what's going on when you've got somebody as maniacal and narcissistic as Trump as the leader of this country, you know, and, you know, one needs to find that strength within. And the bottom line, you got to break it back down to one very important quality of life. It doesn't matter who or what you are. You eradicate class out of it because it's such a dangerous you know, dormant weapon when people judge you or people don't, you know, include you or you're excluded. But the bottom line, it's respect. It's respect to just say, that person's equal to me. It's when somebody shows you respect, you never forget it. Doesn't matter who they are, mm. you know, but when somebody disrespects you or doesn't think that you're equal to them, you know, it's sort of classic stuff. You never forget what people say or do, but you'll always remember how they made you feel, do you know what I mean? And, you know, it's all the great stories and all the wonderful stories that we know in life, but you know, when somebody shows somebody respect, then we, can, then we have a party, then we can sit at the table and then we can talk, you know? And people forgot that, you know, we've all forgotten that, you know? No one's better than anybody else. Mm. And you're, you're starved of it 
if you're starved of it, if you're denied it, if you're abused in any capacity, that's when people turn in to, you know, offenders and they're lacking yeah. in any love or they're lacking in any, lacking yeah. in any warmth and, you know, the cycle of abuse and how it, how it causes dysfunction and, you know, mm. all that. And, you know, people's stories are fascinating, you know, and where people come from and, you know, but we're all the same. And that's the thing. When, when you look at people and you just think, God, you know, but one mustn't become disillusioned in any level. And that's where I think you need your meditation and you need your physical working out and your yoga or your running or your whatever you do. And you have to look after the mind and the body. They're all the same circuit and watch toxicity. You know, we're in a country that's savaged by alcohol abuse, now drug abuse coming from a country that was oppressed, the native person oppressed. So what did they do? They drank like any indigenous community. I've worked in native American circles and, San Francisco communities riddled by riddled by drugs, as you know, and alcohol, and completely disillusioned, extraordinary people, um, and we see that in all you know indigenous communities, and we are the indigenous people, we're the Irish people, so you know it's it's I think we we luckily are now, and I know you are, we're really part of a movement of people to me that are enlightened in a sense, and that's not something that you say lightly to people, or oh, you're enlightened, you know. People that know really that your mental health, that's the steering wheel. You know, people can get through all sorts of physical ailments and physical disabilities, but if you've got the engine in the right direction, your drishni, whatever you want to call it, you know, that is the mothership, that is the engine to keep us all going. And when you see people that are kind, that have respect, that are inclusive, not utter maniacs like we're seeing now or selfish mm. titled fools that are trying to lead their countries. You know, you look at Britain now and you go, mm, how's that working out for you? Do you know what I mean? And you think, you know, it's not about elitism anymore. People have gone beyond that. People want to be inclusive. People want to look after each other. You know, well, I do, you do. So, so Brona, what, what does it mean for you to, to look after yourself? And do you still run the risk of not looking after yourself? I mean, is that a temptation? Because, uh, you know, just being aware of, you know, the CV aspect of you, like you're, you have been what looks like an exceptionally busy and productive human being, you know? So okay. you've been driving the car at a significant pace, let's say. Um, but presumably you've learned to take pit stops and refueling breaks, or is that still a work in progress? I mean, how, what does it look like for you? I think this pandemic, the heartbreak, you know, that we've all been through in the last seven months, you know, um, it's been awful because we've lost friends from it. Like it's just awful. Um, but, you know, when this kicked in, in March, I went, right, Yoga, you know, yoga is my love. If I wasn't doing what I'm doing as a performer or an artist, I'd be teaching yoga or something like that. Cause I just found it. I started yoga about 20, 25 years ago. And, you know, I've gone on date in many different eras in my life, but you know, yoga in Sanskrit means the path. You know, and I just find it not just for the physical body and opening up and losing all the tension and stuff, but the mind, you know, when you stray from yoga, you stray from the path. So for me, having had a hip injury from a fall 100 years ago, I can't really run, but I love running. My father's a great runner, you know, my daddy's always been very fit um, and he's always took us running as kids and stuff. And But I think um, I went down the yoga hole. I didn't go down the red wine every night hole. I went down the walking in Donegal, walking in Derry, walking up the mountains. I mean, I was so blessed. I went back to Derry so I could be near my parents and keep an eye on them. You know, obviously, thank God they're healthy and happy and they're, you know, they look after themselves. But I lived, uh, I grew up in the bog side and then mum and daddy moved to another part of the town. No, but I stayed with my best mate and she's down at the Derry Donegal border. So we walked every day in the sun because the mm. weather was fabulous and i was out i was writing i finished two songs which was great and i 
you know, joined my fantastic friends in Derry online on the Zoom uh, classes. And I went on to the meditation hole, which was great. And I got loads of friends meditating that hadn't been meditating, you know, and just held tight. And I feel so much better for it that I didn't go down, you know, a lot of friends, oh, you know, and I was like, I'm not going down that hole, do you know what I mean? Because alcohol is great. And I've had the times of my life partying and having the crack, but it is a depressive. And we had nowhere to go. And you got to look after yourself. And I just thought, right, let's get in here and let's do the real. Let's get, let's get funky with this pandemic. Let's get in there. Let's get right on it. So I felt it was the first time in six months that I've ever had that kind of a break. We weren't like six months because you didn't get a job or you weren't working. Six months almost of an enforced, you know, sabbatical. So I actually had a great time. I found... Um, I had a quarantine for two weeks. I'm in Manchester at the minute and I was on and out of a job. So the first time I came back after the first sort of filming, I had a quarantine and I found that really hard because it was just on my own and I couldn't go out, obviously, which, which I found quite oppressive and quite tough. But, you know, it is what it is and you get over it, you know. Mm. Yeah. I enjoyed it to a point, you know, it hasn't been obviously easy, but... But I made it work because I know what I'm like. And I just thought, right, this is not going to be easy. But I did all the things that are yeah. things, you know. Yeah, but I'd say the pre- preparatory work probably began 25 years ago. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like it was, you were able to hit the, I, I, I have echoes of that myself. I was like, okay, shit's going down right now. Ah, big time. Bring out the toolbox and the, That's it. You know, That's, like, it. That's it. Big yeah. time. Yeah. 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 Um, no, it's, it's serious. And, and I feel we're going in for another round of it at the moment. So it's, as you said, like it's, it's a, a lot of it's in the mind, but then you, you do need to bring the body into play as well, don't you? Uh, and I mean, I went and jumped in the sea this morning. I'm always ranting on about jumping in the sea, but like it was desperate rain and then cold. And, you know, you just have to transcend and go through. And like, it, it really is about building strength, I feel. You know, like, it's in, in a, like a lot of our buddies, we talk about like, warriorship you know not not in a trivial way but like actually the path of the warrior is is actually also path of non-violence but to have equal yeah. strength you know you, you yeah. can be fierce if you need to be fierce yeah but you can withdraw and be calm and still when you know but you're you're always ready for battle because life in many yeah. ways does bring battle life is battle oh life is a battle 100 percent. no matter who you are you know no matter how privileged you might think people are you know, and I think we've seen such heartbreak over the last eight months, six, seven, or seven months. Um, you know, human beings repeat the same stuff all the time, you know, the same wars, the same injustices, you know, because we think it's going to benefit, we think it's going to work, you know, by killing somebody, by getting that, getting rid of that person, you know, all that stuff. And you know, you're talking about jumping in the sea there and you're talking about warriors, you know, like what I did in March when this happened, you know, I went to the sea as well. You know, I started to study um, gravitational pull and I started to study, which is a massive love of mine and I know the tiniest amount about it, but I still... Well, well, you know more than me because I haven't a clue. So can you please give me some no, no, no. fear? Physics. Physics. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, well, well, what, what, what? Right. If, we can get, if we can get people away from this, right? Ah, okay. Yeah, okay. yeah, yeah. If we can get people away from the mobile phone, right? And kids especially. And in, in our modern society, and you look around and the hours people spend in the phone, on the phone, in a very dangerous place of comparison. Mm. Comparison is the fastest road to misery, right? And you've seen the increase in suicide amongst young people. Yeah, particularly young women. Yeah, yeah right. I came up in that social dilemma documentary, yeah. if you've seen that. Yeah. yeah, I only watched a bit and then I stopped. I kind of stopped TV. Oh, well, and you kind of get the picture, you know. It's, yeah, yeah, yeah. I can imagine. I have friends have said to me about it. You know, and we're hearing all these horror stories about what's going on with the mobile phones. But comparison is the fastest road to misery. You know, we live on a ball, floating about space, 
flying about space and the gravitational pull between the moon and the sun and planet Earth, how does it all work? You take it for granted. Every day mm. you get up and you jump in the sea and you take it for granted. Or you maybe don't. It is a miracle. And this is me coming from the bog side, looking at life through heartbreak, through yeah. joy, through everything. But I'm telling us now, telling everybody now that's listening to this, get in to studying how it all works because it is fascinating and yeah. every morning is a miracle. It is a miracle without sounding like an absolute fruit loop. We live in the most extraordinary place and human beings are only a part of it. We look at David Attenborough and we look at the documentaries about the sea and it leaves us speechless. But this is where we live and we do have time to salvage it. And there is heartbreak, heartbreak. And you know, about what we've done to planet Earth. But it really is a miracle, you know. I mean, that's not, you know, in any way meant to sound, hey man, new agey, it is. So get into it and yeah. teach children about space. Yeah. And teach children that in deep, deep space, that there's rain, but it rains sapphires and it rains diamonds and it rains rubies because of compression and gravity. And, and you know, scientists are picking up footage of tiny red, Things. What is that? Oh, it's actually rubies. It rains rubies out there. I mean, mind blowing. Get your head out of the goddamn phone and start studying space. You know, and to me, it makes you extremely humbled. It makes you sit there and go, "Wow," you know. And we will move through this horrific period of politics as it is. And this, you know, as Dylan has always said, and I keep quoting it at the moment. They say the darkest hour is right before the dawn. We hope so. We hope so in our country. We hope so for Britain, for all our wonderful British friends that don't want to see what's happening there happen. And that the elitists, the, the entitled, you know, horrendous, selfish, stupid people that are running these places are, you know, hopefully not voted for and they won't go through with the next elections, Britain and America. And we start to realize how simple life can be if you start to look beyond yourselves and money and oppression because there isn't any better feeling than love. And there isn't any better feeling than when you make up with somebody if you have, have had a terrible falling out with somebody. We all know that feeling. And that's what I'm talking about. The basis of every human being's heart is respect and love unless you've got severe mental health issues. But, you know, that's all that matters. And go out on a on a frequency of love rather than a frequency of hate because I've been really angry with people in my life and I've been really disappointed by people in my life but I know for me the only way forward is non-aggression and non-violence and that is why you need your meditation and that is why the great messengers are sent and them's the people that have real strength because all those guys that have murdered those people in America at the minute and we're seeing that horrific stuff. You know, they're doing it because they know they can get away with it, you know. But the great people write about it and the great people leave behind the knowledge and the wisdom because we all are going to die, we're all going to go, but what have you left behind, you know? We're all just fleeting, you know? So let's leave behind the wisdom, let's leave behind what can teach the young people because that to me, Every, we're going to lose everything at some point, no matter how much wealth you have. Do you mm -hmm. know what I mean? It mm -hmm. doesn't matter if I've got a diamond, you know, shaped heart, a diamond shaped house, a diamond car. It doesn't matter what I look like or what I achieve in my life. I don't need validation from people. What I need is to know that I'm a good person and that I'm going to be good to be around and it's not all about me. Um, I want to pick up, um, so you've spoken very eloquently about love and like, I suppose that I, I came to that conclusion a few years ago where love and courage were two guiding principles in my life that if you're going to pick a religion, I'll go with the love one and whatever subset of that people choose is up to them. But uh, I also identified courage as an important 
I yeah. suppose it's a virtue, but it, it also implies action, you know, and I suppose I don't really mind if I'm called an activist or not, but I do believe in action and I believe in action. And I also believe that we can kind of know all of this stuff, but to actually put it into practice uh, is a whole yeah, other trip, you know, and that's where I feel like the courage bit. Like, I'm sure you've had moments in your life where the acting or the music or the money or whatever it was mm. that you had to really draw on that well and pull some kind of sword out or I mean has that been has that does that resonate for you is there as regards activism well I suppose I mean I'm I'm, I'm conflating a whole bunch of stuff and <laughs> big question there you brought me up to the stars, into the cosmos there, so I'm Hi. still on my way back down. But um, no, I, I suppose what I'm really interested in is you in your life and your various vocational creative expressions. There are different mm -hmm. paths on the bigger path, whether it be acting or music. Hi. Most people I know on those paths are similar have had to steer very stormy seas at different points Aye. by virtue of the career precarity or whatever it is. Yeah, yeah. And that to, to survive and thrive as long as you have, you've obviously learned a few things along the way about courage. That's my assumption. Yeah, it's nice. Eh? Um, well, I mean, there's, you know, well, like courage, courage is, is, is the flip side of fear. So fear is your greatest enemy. Fear, all the classic quotes that we know, fear makes your world smaller. You know, feel, feel the fear and do it anyway. You know, like everyone suffers from fear. Yeah. And I have certainly suffered massively from fear. Um, you know, I've watched my father suffer from fear and very rightfully justified fear, bringing up a family in the bog and watching what happened around him and to his community um, and protecting us as a family. And I've had to work at that massively. And, you know, I work... I work with fear, eradicating it every day. That's why I do my yoga, my meditation, and listen to the right stuff. And I'm humbled by, again, what I say about the planet and where we live. And I need to connect to that. I need to feel that because it makes complete sense to me. It makes complete sense to me to create a, almost like a spider web, like a, like a you new know, Spider-Man and stuff comes out of his hands. You know, you need to connect to that and that's where your spirituality brings you in. But, you know, the greatest, the greatest thing one can learn is that this too shall pass. Acting and the music, it, it's a world full of judgment and every time you go for an audition, you're rejected or you're brought in. It's a world of judgment and... It's a world of wonderful, wonderful opportunity and you get to travel around the world. And when I look now, you know, at the places I've been and the places I've worked and the people I've worked with and the opportunities that I've got and the people that I've met and Jesus, I open books sometimes. I think, my God, that, that, that's a handwritten note from John Berger. You know, that's a handwritten note from, you know, blah, blah, blah you know what I mean? And you just think, you know, those people... Those people changed the way of art. Those people changed the way of literature. They inspired generations of writers or cinema makers. And he bought me that and that stuck on my wall. You know what I mean? So, you know, I work at it because I have to work at it. Uh, otherwise, you just feel sad. But, you know, every human being that I can relate to, no matter who they are, uh, to me, they're either walking the good walk or they're not. And you'll often find the most successful people at the really top end of their game are so approachable. They are not full of their own crap. They are approachable, open human beings, you know, that care about other people. And 
you know, they're, they're, they're a joy to be with because they get it, you know, mm. and it's a race, the human race, you know, race and do what, you know what I mean? You know, we're humans, it's humanity, you know, like I hate the terms mixed race, you know, and things like that. I don't know what the PC term is, but we're all the one race. There's no mixed race. You know, it's the human, human beings, you know, humanitarianism is where it's at community, not cross community, you know, so, you know, you, you work at it because people can flick switches in their minds, but cognitive work is where it's at. And the cognitive, you know, wheels that we can fall back into are the danger zones, you know. You had a slip. People that are alcoholics or drug addicts, they had a slip. And a slip is back into the old way because it's easier to do that than to actually push out of that circle, push out of that, you know, place of fear where you think, it's not going to work out, you know, but life is work. Life is hard work, you know, and sometimes, you know, you'll go full circle the way the moon goes around the sun and the sun, you know, and the way we're all spinning and you'll come back and you'll know a bit more, you know, and you're older and wiser and you'll know a bit more, you know. So, you know, it, it, it's a daily work, but you're talking about jumping in the sea, you know. A friend of mine was talking about the importance of gardening and the importance of jumping in the sea. And if you think about it, you know, you're floating about and you're floating about in planet Earth and gravity keeps you st stood yeah. still, you know. Yeah. And you see the people in space and how they float under the space. And when you see Chris Hetfield playing his guitar, you know, and he's floating about in uh, space, you know, what grounds you is gravity and it keeps you grounded. But the sea is also connective. You know, and when you jump in the sea, it is actually, you're part of where you're from. So it's almost like a blanket. So it actually does something, you know, from a physics point of view, it actually connects you back to where you're from. Yeah. yeah. So there is something maybe that it is not something that one can articulate or put into words, but it's when you put your hand into the earth from a connective point of view, that's where you're from, you know? So people say, oh, I'm grounded by gardening. You know, you're touching what you're from, you know, yeah, you yeah. photosynthesis and all the stuff that we need. You know, when people talk to plants, you know, and they say, oh, you know, the wee plant is extraordinary for people that, you know, when people do experiments on water, you know, and they shout at the water or they play heavy metal at the water and all the, you know, when they microscope, you know, send the micro, uh, what do you call it, the microscopic evidence saying up. You have, you have to play soul music to the water. Oh, but... I, people do. And they're like, you know, like, you know, <laughs> you know what I mean? It's funky right, water. You know, you know, funky <laughs> I water, love it. Right? We should start a water funky water. But you know what I mean? It's that kind of stuff, you know. So, you know, it is, it's, it's, it's energy and that's what we are and that's where we came from. And it's, you know, you know, you feel people's energy and I think that's what it's all about, you know. And you, you feel people's bad energy. People go into houses and they say, Jesus, there's a bad energy in there, you know. Bad Jesus, vibes, yeah. Bad vibes, you know, it is. I mean, everything's vibes, you know. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. Um, I, I will finish up now, Bruno, but I just want to say I watched your um, your Van Morrison tribute video and I just thought like you were really giving it. <laughs> like, uh, Van the Man. Yeah. Oh, we love Van the Man. Well, Van's no. on his own wee journey, like as we all are. But um, like it was just, it was really joyful to see. I actually find myself watching a lot of music videos recently, particularly right. live music. Right. I, I mean, that's obviously because there's a deficit, but... I, there's just something about watching a performer be in the music, you know, and oh, I just thought that and you it was, you know, so cool. I mean, we had a great day. I mean, you know, certain things come at certain times and Van Morrison is, is he is an extraordinary, extraordinary artist, yeah, you know, he is. no doubt about it. You know, there's only a few like them really, jo you know, Joni Mitchell, Van, Bob, you know, Neil Young, you know, there's a certain sort of elk of that type of artist and Jimi Hendrix, you know, that were just, you know, the unique, unique artists. No one can ever say that they, they, uh, they phoned it in, you know, their body of work, you know, and it's extraordinary and, and the quality of the body of work. Have you seen Aretha Franklin's Amazing Grace? I don't believe so, no. Well, if you want to see somebody, that. you want to see somebody in uh, in the zone. That's the film. It only only came out, uh, I think, about a year and a half ago on a movie. It was uh, 
it was shot in 1972 and it was um, never made into the movie that it was shot as, but they finally sort of salvaged all the footage mm -hmm. and they made it into the most extraordinary film. But that's my favorite record. And then they finally were able to, um, you know, suddenly Pollock shot it all, but the, a lot of it was kind of damaged, but obviously we technology now they were able to salvage it, but it's incredible. It's incredible. Well, that we're gonna gonna encourage people to go and check that out, uh, Bronan. And, and I mean, here's what can I say? Like, just thanks very much for your time. And here's, you. here's to the music, and here's to community and humanity and space and sea and the whole shebang. Yeah, and respect, man. Just just be cool, you know. You know, it's a classic thing, isn't it? Treat people the way you like to be treated, you know. And and get right in there, man. Get right under it, you know get into the respect because that's what it's about you know no matter who you don't have to love everybody in a sense but just say that's your thoughts and let's try and find that strength not to react you know even to your you know your nearest and dearest you know because this and this isn't a dress rehearsal you know this is the real thing you know but this, this is it and i mean the more we uh the more we respect and understand that you know what would you have done you know what would you have done differently you know yeah. Get on it, man, you know, and, and watch and respect other cultures and, and politicize young people and teach people what matters, you know, and look out for those and, and don't keep looking for justification and validation from people. Do things and don't look for validation. You know, just get in there. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. <laughs> Praise the Lord. <laughs> Woo. Woo. <laughs> Thanks, Brona. Namaste. Namaste. God bless. Um, Take care. <laughs>